Welcome everybody. We're sitting here actually now in at the Swedish Arts Committee uh, in their building, beautiful building in our yellow chairs. And we, who are we? Three eminent critics. Uh, some of you also are translators and authors, but uh, all of you are critics, and that's the main thing today when we are going to talk about Swedish books mm. uh, from this year. And let me first introduce Jukiko Duke, Jenny Högström, and Jonas <laughs> Tente. Jonas Tente. I've known Jonas for years. That's why I laugh. But you always forget. <laughs> <laughs> You're too familiar. Well, that's why I've known you <coughs> yeah. for so long. We're on first name basis. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, myself, I, my, my name is Ingrid Ela, and I also happen to be a critic. Mm. So, and talking about this year's books, it seems to me it's a fantastic book year in Sweden a lot of really good books. So it's been difficult to pick out of this heap of, of good books. Mm. And we are going to talk about prose and uh, poetry, yeah. uh, fiction. Mm. And I think we should start right away. And I'll ask you, Yukiko, what did you choose? Well, I think it's been an extraordinarily good year for poetry. And uh, thus I've chosen Gila Mosaid's Ottonde Landet, the eighth country of Gila Mosaid, who in 1986, at the age of 38, came to Sweden. She fled from Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, a decade later, she published her first collection of poetry in Swedish, an eminent one. And uh, in that one, and in the six subsequent, she has combined Persian literary tradition, which um, means a lot of metaphors and references with uh, her own observations as a refugee living in Sweden. But in Ottonde Landet, she's succeeded in forging her two worlds together. So, uh, the lost country, Iran, has come a little bit closer to Sweden, her new home country. So when she stands on her balcony and she sees the blackbird, it reminds her of um, a garden in Shiraz in Iran and the Persian nightingales. Mm -hmm. This is such a beautiful um, collection of poetry in which I think she has reached a new level of simple beauty. Mm -hmm. It's such a wonderful piece of poetry. And those birds are so different, but still they both sort of are symbols of yes. song and poetry. Yes, and in some way she also writes about the freedom in not belonging. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is, is something that she has achieved through the years, this feeling of, of uh, freedom and also being able to, to move freely between two cultures. Mm -hmm. And her themes are, have always been exile, mm. to live in exile, what does it mean for you? Exile as an existential um, state, mm. and also uh, opposition, the need for us to oppose censorship and injustice in the world. Um, um, um. I really think it's beautiful if she has found that kind of freedom because I, I remember one of her very early poems that was beautiful. It's about sounds in Swedish she can't pronounce and the frustration uh, when it comes to these sounds that she, she can't pronounce. And now, obviously, she's reconciled with that <laughs> dilemma. So, Jenny, what did you choose? Well, <coughs> as Yukiko said, it's been a strong poetry year, and I had a lot of books to choose amongst. Uh, and so there was this new poetry collection of uh, Anne Halberg called Under Tiden, uh, which is her seventh uh, poetry collection. Her debut was in 2001 with a very short uh, book called Friction. 
and you can hear just in the title uh, something of the tension in that word. Uh, this book also looks like a part of the Swedish very ordinary urban landscape, an electrical cabinet, uh, but you can also view it uh, at least, uh, that's how I read it, as uh, the tombstone of the poet's dead mother. Uh, and the title, Under Tiden, uh, is In the, in the Meantime, uh, which is in the meantime as uh, the dying of the mother in the three parts of this book. And it starts off in a kind of uh, fragmented, uh, desperate uh, <laughs> poetry uh, in the first part called Room. And in the second part, Dot, uh, the death of the mother becomes more explicit and maybe also more lyrical. Uh, and in the third part, finally, uh, which is called a streck line, you have two lines of poetry crossing the book. As, as this uh, woman, uh, Linnea, walks through life towards what we might think of as death. Hmm. So it's a kind of um, a heavy book, but also a light book, a book where the, where the poet seeks uh, refuge in uh, uh, exactly the, the ordinary life, ordinary objects, um, cooking, buying grocery, washing the dishes, uh, but also there is some kind of parallel between these ordinary movements and the movement of the poet herself and the poet's work uh, in the words. Sort of the basic uh, things in life. Exactly, yeah. Uh, cooking and death. Cooking she's also, and death. She's, uh, <coughs> she's one of many uh, younger Swedish poets inspired by the, uh, the American uh, language school. Absolutely. So it's of, often fragmentary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a heavy-duty language, so to speak. It is. Uh, and that, it is. that really works when you're moaning, mm -hmm. uh, as she is in this book. Exactly. I mean. Yeah. So she's, she's trying to, to stay in that, mo uh, in that moment and in that morning and to t try to be quote, open to death. Mm. Mm. Uh, but the language is so sensuous. It is. It's, it's so filled with, with very strong images. Mm -hmm. I love, especially the third part, stick. You like so it, it yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it goes very well with also the other parts, that you have both this very kind of fragmented and uh, language uh, poetry and this other more sensual and metaphorical part. Uh, and it is rare that she combines these sides mm -hmm. in her poetry mm -hmm. as she does mm -hmm. uh, in this book. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you, Jonas, you yeah. didn't bring any poetry, but heavy books. Heavy, heavy <laughs> books. <laughs> <laughs> and this one uh, in particular will make you cringe uh, and probably made, uh, made uh, its author cringe. Uh, it's a horrific story, uh, autobiographical. Um, the writer, Christina Herström, she's renowned um, uh, internationally, uh, she, uh, mostly for her, uh, her takes on uh, young adults, uh, on power structures between, uh, well, gender-wise and otherwise, uh, young women, older men, She's been uh, um, translated into uh, film, uh, television, etc. But this novel uh, takes, well, it's another Christina Herstrom. She's 
uh, she, she's uh, under the spell. One night uh, in a uh, Stockholm church, she meets a man, uh, and this man will be her destroyer. That's the title of the book, Ödeläggaren translates as uh, destroyer or devastator, <laughs> uh, which sounds more heavy. Uh, and uh, he's a con man. She doesn't know, of course. Uh, five years, after five years, she's uh, almost homeless. She's deeply in debt, alienated from her family, uh, uh, which despises her because she's uh, uh, duped, easily duped. And this is, of course, it's a happy ending. Uh, I, I can assure you, and you really need that because this is, <laughs> <coughs> this, is this is a terrible story. She gets dragged down deeper and deeper in, in uh, uh, this guy's, uh, the con man's web. Uh, and uh, um, no one can believe, wh why, why? You're an intelligent woman, you've written about these things, and still you fall for this. But she's very vulnerable. And she's uh, looking back, she, u she uses her diaries uh, to, to describe this. And she can, now she can, of, of course, she can see what she does and what she doesn't do uh, and how stupid she was. But, uh, so we cringe with her mm -hmm. when we read this. And it's, uh, uh, well, it, it, it's a good story and it's a true story. Actually, mm -hmm. I started reading it yeah. and I read half of the book and I felt like I felt when I was a child and I didn't dare to look at television <laughs> <laughs> because I would sit like this mm -hmm. it was so terrible how can she do this <laughs> and, and uh, I, it's really painful yeah it is it is and she, all, all the time she knows what she, and she's sometimes she she kind of wakes up from this spell and then immediately he because he, he's, a, he's very very good He's very good. Uh, he, he finds her uh, weak spots, goes in, uh, tickles it, and then she's back and borrows another 100,000. But it, is this a system of his? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So he does it with... Afterwards, okay. afterwards yes. when he's... Uh, because he, he gets... He like, must have seen her and seen her vulnerability. Yeah, and, and then he, he, he fishes for you know, the relationship to, to, to her father, uh, to, to her sons, to her uh, feelings of inadequacy, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And he uses... That. And she had cancer once, and this is, this is, of course... And he's also very world... Uh, New worldish mm. or uh, new age, new age, oh. yeah. So there's a lot of astrology. There's a lot of lot of conscience streams and soul soulfulness and mindfulness and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and she she just <laughs> buys it <laughs> but over but and over again. She's got some kind of dry humor too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you she gotta have. <laughs> <laughs> Because when the, oh, in the very beginning, when she comes back from church and her children ask her, mm. uh, who, who, did you meet somebody in church? Mm. And she says, well, I didn't meet God. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but she did. But she did. <laughs> or the devil. Yeah, or whatever. The devil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually brought mm, poetry too. Mm. And uh, uh, this is, of course... Uh, a uh, known poet, Kjell Espmark, member of the Swedish Academy. And uh, he's so actually... Is, so is Gilla Mossad, by the yes. way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, he, this book came out to his 90th birthday. It consists of three books of poetry and the last one. A host of witnesses, I would say. Not yeah. a host of daffodils, but a host or of witnesses. Or angels. <laughs> a host of witnesses. Yeah. And it's... Um, it's what you would call uh, role poetry. I mean, uh, the I, the teller in the in these poems is always somebody else, never him, mm. never, never autobiographical I. It can be anonymous people, it can be colleagues. It is. Uh, it starts with um, a painter in the ancient caves who painted boars or. or animals and it ends up with a person drowning at the coast of Lesbos mm. so today mm. refugees and I think the theme is very much uh, dying and uh, being uh, 
having the last word, last famous words before you die, or telling your story, and often you can have, you can of, often recognize uh, the the culture where it comes from. This must be ancient Greece. This must be mm. here or there. But but often they are completely anonymous, and you can you can sort of decipher who they are. It's it's a poetry that is totally different from Anna Halberg. Yeah. It's about death and dying. It's also about that life still is better than death. There is always something better than death. And but but it's a classical poetry. It's a it's a readable poetry in the way Nobel Prize winners are readable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's it's that kind of poetry. But. I actually heard him read these poems mm. in, in Gothenburg with a lot of young poets. Mm. And sometimes the oldest is the youngest because he <laughs> read yeah. them in a fantastic way. Mm. So, and, and they're so easy uh, uh, to absorb. They're so easy to understand and they sort of get right into you. And um, uh, it, it aims at your heart and it, mm. it, it really goes there. And he does this in such a, a light way, and still it's a, a lot of, he's extremely learned, of course. This is a learned poetry, mm. but he carries this learnedness. This and he puts, amongst these uh, different people from different eras, he sometimes turns up himself. Yes. <laughs> like the writer yeah. uh, 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 complaining about something, about reviews or something, so uh, there's kind of a, Little tongue in cheek. Yeah, uh, sometimes. Well, he always has. Yes, yes, he always has. <laughs> he, he's always there, like Hitchcock in yeah. his films, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sort of waving at you. Yeah. <laughs> but but there's also very sensitive. I mean, he really brings it up to today's conflicts and and catastrophes. Mm. Uh, like ending in Lesbos is, if if you start with the first pieces of art mm. that we know about and you end up in a drowned outside of Lesbos. It's, it's really about the decay of culture, too. Yeah. So, and you brought a second book. Yes, I did. Um, I actually Yukiko. brought a third one, too. Yeah. <laughs> See what we can manage to squeeze in. Mm -hmm. Sen for Hem. Then Off I Went Home by Karin Smirnov. And this is the uh, third part in a loosely connected trilogy about Jana Kippo, who is um, bad-tempered, sullen, um, ordinary-looking middle-aged woman who returns home to her village uh, in the remote north of Sweden. And um, she's been away for quite some time. She's been away in the big city and she has returned to help her brother uh, because he's dying of alcoholism, so she needs to help him, and she does. And this she does in the first part of the trilogy, and then in the second part, she and her brother goes up to the north with their mother's body in order to bury her. And then comes this third part in which Jana Kippo finally succeeds in um, becoming an artist in Stockholm. But <laughs> her native village calls upon her again, and she returns to um, memories of a childhood that hasn't been too happy mm. and also to a lot of very interesting figures in her home village who in different ways are connected to her. Mm. I don't know what it is with Westerbotten County in the north of, Sto of Sweden, but it's a county which has produced so many great writers in Sweden and, well, Corinne Smirnov is, mm -hmm. is a new writer from this area as well. Mm. And what about her language? Yes, her yeah. language is, I think, um, is extraordinary. It's mm. a combination of um, dialectal mm. prose and um, I think she's a, a great stylist actually because mm. she succeeds in, in melting together um, a very clever uh, forward movement in her prose with these dialectal sometimes a bit difficult to understand <laughs> mm -hmm. ways of turning, uh, turning her uh, sentences around, which is uh, quite interesting, I think. Mm. 
I think maybe it could be different, difficult to translate, maybe. Mm. But interesting it is, and uh, a good piece of narrative it is as well. And, and, and talking about Westerbotten or the northern parts of Sweden, uh, don't you think that this moves around? Uh, if you look at 100 years ago, it was Värmland, where uh, a lot of, of great Swedish authors came from. But it's really true that it's a very small part of northern Sweden, too, where you have this uh, very many great writers. And perhaps they inspire each other. Perhaps it uh, becomes a tradition. Maybe. And maybe it has something to do with oral tradition as well. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know either. Yeah. But interesting it yeah. is. Yeah, but if you read a lot of uh, Swedish prose, you know, you, although you've never been to these parts in Sweden, you, you would find your way, like, <laughs> like your own pocket. Yes. Right. That's true. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. But, but there's a lot of way to find, because yeah. a, lot, a lot of forests and loneliness. Yeah, and loneliness and forest, like a, a <laughs> northern gothic. <laughs> Yes. But also a lot of returners these days. Yeah. Have you thought about that? So yeah. many novels are about people returning from the big cities yes, mm -hmm. but to the small remote villages. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a kind of a, a genre. Mm -hmm. I think so. And, and if you look 100 years back, they were all leaving northern Sweden right. for the big cities. Yeah. And now there's... For, the a long, for a long time. For a very long time, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And now there's this opposite This big direction. exodus. Swedish exodus. Yeah. Yeah. Homecomers. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. But you've chosen, Jenny, you've chosen something quite different. Quite different, yes. It's one of my favorite young Swedish writers, Christopher Folkhammar, who is, well, he's a writer and a critic and a poet. Uh, and this uh, book is called I Takt i Natt, and it's supposed to be read out loud. And I was so unhappy this spring when the release of this book was cancelled and, you know, the big reading. So there was a reading, a live reading on Facebook and so, but, but still you can't, beat the <laughs> you can't beat the real thing. But still we have this great poetry collection. Uh, and I will just read the first page for everybody to get a hold on it. Uh, if you have skin, pull it back. If you have time, turn it back. You can come on our side. <laughs> uh, so you have uh, a very gay theme in this book. You have a you and you have this we that are trying to lead this you into temptation. Um, and uh, you, have, uh, you have the throats, and you have the swallow, and you have all this like, uh, explicit lyrics of gay culture that is part of, of the writing of Christopher Folkhammer. Uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, a contagion. And you have uh, what do you call... Uh, the anti-retrovirals, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and you have tests. So with this kind of uh, nightlife of gay men, I must, uh, I must uh, underline the gay male scene, uh, and the male bodies meeting in the night. Uh, so you have this kind of threat of the HIV and the AIDS mm -hmm. uh, of this promiscuous life mm. uh, that you, but also this kind of, uh, uh, also the, the po poetry itself is depicted as a kind of contagion. Mm. So you have this kind of switch between um, uh, the poem as sweet, as a pop song. I was actually, when I was thinking about this book, the title of the book, I Takt i Natt, I thought about the rhythm of the night, you know, mm. the pop song by Corona. Mm. So you have this kind of Euro trash uh, pop song, uh, 
but also like the poem as a lullaby mm. and it's dangerous mm. at the same time. Uh, so you have these two uh, sides of the thing. So it's love, love poetry under, under stress. Under stress, absolutely. And you can, li but I mean, you can read this literally as about only gay culture, uh, but of course you can read it metaphorically as well mm. Mm. as something about the death that awaits us all and the plagues that haunts humanity today, mm. <laughs> which becomes... We, we all seem to have chosen very, very sort of uh, dark, uh, dark books yes. dwelling on death yeah. and, <laughs> and loneliness, and, but you really... Well, this... Jonas. <laughs> yes, this is a national treasure. Uh, he's called uh, Klaus Östergren. Um, and I, I, do, I doubt that he thought that he would write this when he started uh, the trilogy, uh, starting with uh, Gentlemen in 1980. Mm -hmm. And this was a phenomenon. He, he, he immediately became one of the household names. Everybody has to read that novel mm. about two mysterious brothers uh, and the writer, Klaus Östergren. Uh, meeting them and getting um, sucked up into a mystery. So there was a mystery novel, but also a discussion about uh, Sweden as a nation, uh, a hypocritical nation in a way, uh, teaching morals to the rest of the world while selling guns to, to, uh, to, to war zones, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, that was supposed to be a one-off, in 1980, but in 2007, uh, there came a part two called uh, Gangsters, uh, which continued the saga, the story. Um, this is part three, uh, Renegades, Renegator. And now, well, the story continues, uh, the um, uh, illustrious Henry Morgan, uh, which is the main character apart from the writer himself, uh, returns from South Africa uh, to the south of, uh, of Sweden where the, where the writer lives. And on it goes, uh, the story about post-war Sweden and its darker sides. Uh, also, uh, because uh, Klaus Östergren, the writer, he was a member of the Swedish Academy uh, for three years, I think, uh, until he resigned uh, famously uh, because of the scandals, the hypocrisy, and everything in this uh, uh, fine institution, maybe the, the <laughs> one of the finest institutions <laughs> that we have in the world. Uh, he, uh, uh, he couldn't take it anymore, and so he makes a point on this in the, because it's, it's about Swedish hypocrisy. Mm. Of course, uh, these doings uh, he, he retells uh, in, in a large uh, portion of this novel. Mm. Uh, and that is, of course, quite scandalous in itself uh, and will be much debated, his take on this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually 200 pages. It's two, yeah, <laughs> 200 pages. Uh, so it's like a novel in a novel. Is he self-righteous or how is he, what's this? <laughs> well, what can you say? No, his, no because the, the, this, no. Is a, uh, this is a persona mm. in... Um, uh, I mean, he, he, Klaus Östergren is the person in Klaus Östergren's roman, he's a, the, the teller. Mm. So, uh, no, of course he thinks he's, uh, he's just mo mo more of an observer mm -hmm. of something that he's getting dragged into. Mm. Uh, and then Actually, he is lured into writing this report, yeah. which makes him forget the Ex real crisis in the world. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, the real conflict. Yeah. Mm. This is just something... Uh, yeah, Unimportant. he makes fiction, fiction out of it. Yeah. It's, yes. really, it's really funny. Because yeah. He also 
calls everybody in the academy, uh, gives them names of, of various weeds, yeah, right. the most oh. <laughs> unconspicuous flowers yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. They don't even flower, they're just right. weeds. So it's a sort of a, a Romain de Cleve, uh, you know, everybody knows who, who, who he's talking yeah, about, yeah. but they got different <laughs> names, yeah. so. It's really funny. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I think it's, uh, he's interesting, Claude again because he, he doesn't make his persons, he, he doesn't give them a lot of psychology and so on. Mm. He's an observer. Yeah. He observes phenomena in, in, in Sweden. Uh, yeah, and also I, I, I spoke to him, asked him about this once. I, I say that you're, you're always a better writer when it's you in the, in the mm. leading part. Mm. Mm. Uh, in third person, you're not as good. And he said, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's, he's not pompous at all. No, he's not. Yes, he's, but, well, actually, the last book that we will be able to talk about, because time is flying, is, uh, will take us back to northern Sweden again. Mm -hmm. It's Annika Norlin, I See Everything You Do, Jag ser allt du gör. And this is a lovely little book. I, I'm such a prejudiced person, so when I <laughs> heard that she was writing her first book, because she's a, a songwriter. She has, uh, has published six, uh, uh, what do you call them, records, albums, albums. with, uh, albums, with yeah. uh, songs. And I thought, well, 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 let's see what she can do. And <laughs> I was completely sort of drawn into these stories that are very much northern Swedenish. Mm. Uh, they are very much about people having sorrows being sad about things, sad about not being seen, sad about not succeeding, and, and to the, the very uh, worst kind of sadness, the sadness you have when you lose a child. Mm. And she tells these stories in a very special uh, sort of colloquial style. Mm. Uh, I think one of the phrases she uses is, uh, when mother died, I was sorry, but I wasn't surprised. <laughs> Just mm. flat like that. And it hits you. And, and uh, because he's got so much humor in the, uh, in the sense when humor means that you realize that life is, uh, is tragic. Mm. You can't do anything about it but laugh. <laughs> and, and I really like these novels. There's, and I know you've read them. Yeah, 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 uh, with great delight. You must. Uh, and uh, uh, just as you, as you say, um, the flatness, or it's like it's two persons writing this. One is a young girl, and one is a very, very much older woman. Mm. Uh, and they meet kind of in the analysis of life's basics, mm. which is often, as we know, death. <laughs> mm. So, uh, and she's also extremely funny at mm. times, mm. Uh, and I mean extremely funny. She, she's a kind of funny that doesn't feels like it's glued on, mm. but it comes from language. Mm -hmm. It comes from from within, mm -hmm. uh, and you have it's to. It comes from under text. It's comes. Yeah, from right. And you have uh, to meet her halfway because she demands very much from her reader. Mm. Actually, I think all our choices demand a lot from the reader and why should we otherwise read if yeah. we are not demanded upon. Mm. Thank you very much Yukiko, Jenny and Jonas. Thank it's been you. great talking books with you. I wish we would have more time but now time is up.